Good morning again and welcome to this fourth in GFA series of Water First webinars in, that have taken place during this month of September. Um, my name is Stacey Isaac Barraza. I'm with a firm called IB Environmental and I'll be helping moderate and facilitate today's webinar. The topic today is watershed assessments. And so we have some great speakers lined up for you. Um, we want you to know that we want you to participate as much as possible. You've given up some of your time this morning to participate in this webinar. So please go ahead and ask questions or make comments that are relevant to today's topic. So if you will, there's a question box that you will see. Um, we'll go through some of these logistics. So maybe the next slide, Andrew. Okay, so here you see some ways that you could use and benefit from the GoToWebinar platform. And I'll highlight a couple ways that you can also interact with it. So in your control panel, you can see that there's a little red arrow there that you can either, um, you can click that red arrow to um, open the control panel so you see all the features as displayed here, or you can toggle back and forth between closing it so that you don't see um, as much detail. Throughout the webinar, we may ask you questions and we'd like you as participants to raise your hands and then the facilitators will put all hands down um, in case we have a second question. Um, you should be muted, uh, so that's not an, an issue for the participants today, but we encourage you to submit your questions in this question box. So the first pretend question would be, if you can enter your name, your organization, and then this one's a little bit more complicated. So name your organization, and then what have you been doing different in terms, differently in terms of communication with your clients, the public, et cetera, in light of COVID-19's restrictions. So um, maybe you've switched to virtual meetings instead of having in-person meetings. Maybe you can add some details there. So that's kind of relevant to today's session. So if you put something in there that, if you found something useful um, in your organization in terms of changing how you do public outreach or public input, that'd be great. And we'll try to share those with the rest of the folks. So this is about not only hearing from the speakers and pre presenters today, but also hearing from each other. So again, your name, your organization, um, and what you might have been doing differently that's been successful in terms of COVID-19. And I'll just remind folks that if you are not speaking in terms of our speakers, we can go ahead and mute ourselves. Um, but the next slide is um, basically the agenda. And at this point, I will hand over to Ansley, Ansley Jones and Osha Bahadman. They are the two folks who are really key today because they run the Water First program at GIFA. Thanks, Ansley, Osha Bar. Thanks. Thank you, Stacey. All right, so as Stacey mentioned, I'm Ansley Jones and Osha Bar Hardman will be speaking in a moment. Um, the two of us run the Water First program since it moved to GIFA and we're very excited to be in this role. Um, always love working with communities and helping to get the word out about Water First. So we're so thankful we've been able to do these webinars this year. Uh, so this is our agenda for today. Uh, we just went through the GoTo webinar introduction. And now Oshabar and I are gonna do a quick introduction to Water First overall. Uh, this will be similar to what you've heard before if you've joined us for our other webinars, but it'll just be a quick little intro and then we'll dive into today's real content all about watershed assessment. The first presentation will be by Adam Sukunik and Jennifer McCoy with Cobb County. And then the second presentation will be by Jennifer Scott and Jerry Hood with Town of Brasselton. Um, like in the presentations and our webinars before, we have included poll questions to keep you engaged throughout the presentation. So please interact with us on those. Um, it's great to kind of see where we're at with uh, different audiences, uh, levels of knowledge so far. That's what this is all about, is to be a learning experience. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer session uh, for all of the speakers. Um, but please, throughout the presentations today, utilize that question box that Stacy mentioned. Um, that way we'll have some good questions to queue up at the end of the presentation. Finally, when we conclude the webinar, um, please note that when you close out of GoToWebinar, you'll be asked to complete a survey. And we really, really appreciate you guys doing that. Um, that'll help us improve this type of programming in the future. All right, so what is Water First? 
Water First is a local government designation for communities that have gone above and beyond what their state requirements are in terms of water resources and environmental planning. These communities have taken a proactive approach and have recognized that watersheds extend beyond political boundaries. So they work with partners, uh, neighboring jur jurisdictions, um, state agencies, and even non-governmental organizations um, to work on quality of life improvements to make sure that water resources are protected. The overarching goal of Water First is to encourage Georgia communities to put in investments today so that future generations will benefit from the environmental and economic work that is putting into place, put into place today. So I just wanted to give you all a quick run through of what it looks like to apply for the Water First designation. The first piece of the process is a paper application um, that you can download from GIFA's website and it all can be filled out electronically. There's a Word document and a, an Excel spreadsheet. This spreadsheet is called the Water First Checklist, and you can see a, a snippet of that here, but this is just a small piece of it. The Water First Checklist is a very comprehensive um, spreadsheet because it contains the nine categories within Water First, and there are sub items underneath each category. So OSHA Bar will go into what these categories are in just a minute. Um, since the program moved to GFA, we've moved to a rolling application. So you can submit at any time of the year. And also Oshabar and I are very happy to help you guys with completing these items. If there's any checklist items that you're unsure of what it means or need clarification, just reach out. We're just an email or phone call away. After we receive the full application, uh, we send it on to an application review committee who scores the application and determines whether you've met the threshold to move on to the next stage in the process, which is the on-site review. Now, some communities aren't quite ready for the on-site on -site review right away, and that's okay. What you'll instead join is what's called the Water First Class, which is a time where OSHA Bar and I will come out to your community and learn more about, you know, beyond what is said on your application so that we can tailor technical assistance to your needs. Um, throughout the process, we'll be helping you gear up for this on-site review, which is a day when you invite existing Water First designees to your community to show off what you've done in the, in the realm of all of the Water First uh, categories. So it's a pretty extensive presentation and then you take the reviewers out for a tour of somewhere interesting in your community. Uh, this picture here was from a tour in Hall County who got designated back in 2019 and this is their band along litter trap um, which helps keep the streams clean. Um, once you've completed the review, the Water First designee review team will provide evaluations, and if you've met the next threshold to become designated, GFA will communicate that to you. And with that, I'll let Oshabar continue. Thanks, Ansley. So as Ansley stated uh, previously, um, with the Water First checklist, we look for nine criteria that makes up uh, the Water First checklist, and they include the watershed assessment, which we'll be discussing today, um, the stormwater master planning, uh, wastewater treatment and management, uh, water supply planning, water supply protection, water conservation, water reclamation and reuse, educational outreach, and regional water planning. And with all of these nine criteria, uh, as was stated on the checklist, they are very extensive. And so we understand that all communities don't uh, do every aspect of these nine criteria. So it is very key and important to collaborate with other entities that you can work together to accomplish these things. And we wanna make sure that these communities that are applying for Water First designation 
uh, definitely um, toot their horn in a sense to express everything that they are doing within their community. So the, these nine criteria are what we're looking for um, as it relates to making sure that you are covering these nine uh, criteria. Next slide. Um, so with uh, becoming a water first um, designation or designated community, um, you have some financial incentives and these financial incentives gives you the ability to have some level of fiscal sustainability. Uh, so these financial incentives include the 1% interest rate reduction uh, for G4 water related projects, which could be a good, a good opportunity to save some funds um, for the community. Uh, annual eligibility on DCA community development block grants for water related projects. Um, priority for the EPD 319 grant funding. So these are definitely great incentives that um, communities can take advantage of when they become a water first designation, designated community. Also, um, other benefits are statewide recognition, including road signage and authorization to use the water first logo, um, and then access to the workshops and other networking opportunities, which you know today we're having a webinar. Um, there was a question that was asked even on the last um, webinar about renewal process. And once you become a designee, you have uh, it's a five year period where you get the opportunity to renew every five years. And so we go through, you know, um, the reapplication, a renewal process application to see uh, if there are any things that, that you are doing um, as far as your memorandum of agreement once you become a um a designated community with GFA, and then also any uh goals that you have that you are improving on and that's helping you to continue to, to better yourself as a community um so we look for these as well in the renewal process next slide um current water first de designees since 2003 we've had 34 communities uh well 35 uh with 34 communities actually. Um, and we are in the process of just reviewing um, some communities right now um, to see if they become water first. So these, this number could increase um, and we're hoping that the communities that we have uh, recently reviewed will have an opportunity to be a part of uh, these current water first designees. Um, and as uh, designees, you have all of these incentives that you have to be able to benefit yourself, but um, you can also be designated as an individual community, or you can be designated with uh, multiple municipalities. Uh, in the case of uh, Douglasville and Douglas County Water and Sewer Authority, or in the case of Newton County with all of its municipalities. Uh, so you have communities, individual cities that, um, request to become a water first designees and has become water first designees. And then you also have uh, municipalities that work together uh, to become a water first designated community. Next slide. So uh, currently, this is the map of all of the water first designees and these are the areas of where uh, the majority of the designees are. We have the North pretty much taken care of uh, the southeast um, around the Savannah areas are uh, pretty high populated with water first designees. Uh, we have uh, one down in Tifton um, and we're looking to really continue to publicize what water first is. So we want as many communities to take advantage of this opportunity to really help their communities even have some financial benefits. So we want to we want to see this map get filled up. And so we're doing our part, Anzie and I are doing our part, uh, along as working with others to uh, publicize what Water First is and try to get as many communities um, as designated as possible, because we all need to work together in Georgia uh, as working together with all the communities, everyone is interrelated. And so if we can have as many communities as possible that's designated, that would be a great benefit to the overall water quality within the state of Georgia. Next slide. All right, and with that, we'll turn it over to Stacy. 
And if you guys have any questions, let us know. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Ansley and Oshaba. And as you guys can hear, these folks are very passionate about this program. And so um, you have their contact information here on the screen. And so you can definitely feel free to reach out to them, if not today, uh, with your questions on the webinar later on so that they will they'll help you with your designation. All right, with that, um, just want to check that everything's working smoothly. Um, the screen looks a little bit weird to me. Ansley, how's, how's it coming through on your end? Are you guys able to hear well? I can hear fine. Your screen might be a little frozen, it seems, yeah. but yeah, okay. I can hear you okay, so. Thank you. All right, I wanted to remind folks that we are, again, trying to make this. I would like you to look in your control panel area and let me know if you see under handouts that there are three items there you'll be able to see, hopefully, on your control panel that there are three handouts. If you see those three handouts, please use the raise hand icon that you see also in your control panel to let us know that you found those three handouts. All right, so we're, we're, we're seeing some hands go up. Um, great, so thanks for that feedback. The handouts are for the three different presentations you'll hear today, including the overview that Ansley and Osha Bajas gave. All right, and that said, let's remind folks, um, thank you for putting in your name in the question area, your organization, and um, some way that you've reacted differently in terms of public outreach and public input because of COVID-19, okay? So we have some great suggestions in there already that have been shared with the group, and so we look forward to hearing more. Of course, you can also put in your questions, your actual questions for the speakers. Um, in that question box, and we will uh, reserve time at the end to go through those. So with that said, let's introduce our speakers from Cobb County. So we have Adam Zukanik, who works in the Cobb County Stormwater Management Division as an Environmental Compliance Inspector. He works on protecting water quality and preventing stormwater pollution in that capacity. Previously, Adam spent over 20 years with the Cobb Stream Monitoring Program, building on successful sampling protocols and developing procedures to achieve future goals. Then we'll also hear from his colleague Jennifer McCoy, who manages the Cobb County Water Systems Communication and Education Division. She oversees uh, the water efficiency, watershed stewardship, and communications teams. Um, Jennifer's been with Cobb County Water System since 2000, facilitating environmental education, volunteer management, and compliance efforts to improve local water quality and pollution prevention. So with that, we are going to invite um, Adam and Jennifer to take it away. Good morning. All right, um, well, thanks to everybody for attending and for hosting as well. We can get right into the uh, presentation, if you recall, the one of the slides that was put up with the water first checklist. That's kind of how I assembled these slides. I tried to cover a lot of the topics there, so it's quite a bit. Uh, so I'll go ahead and just uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Cobb County, there's a little bit about us. We're in the metro area, pretty good population, and perhaps most interesting for this presentation, uh, two major river basins, Chattahoochee and Coosa. The kind of northwest uh, area drains up to Kusa and the southeast drains towards Chattahoochee. So the next slide coming up is um, the kind of evolving aspect of uh, water quality and having a program. Um, here in Cobb County, we started Back in the 70s, lab techs would kind of designate areas that they had an interest in sampling upstream and downstream. Perhaps it was an industry or a package plant, and they wanted to look at the water quality uh, above, above the, the, the point and below the point to see if things were getting better or worse. Um, as time went on, more and more of those points popped up, and more and more sites were added to the program. And the program got pretty pretty extensive. And uh, as all of that added up, we kind of 
increased our, our capabilities, let's say. We evolved, we had more sampling, we started adding biological monitoring, um, it became extensive. And by the late 90s, the Cobb County treatment plants started to expand. And that was really a big boost for us. So the Noonday Creek expanded in 1997, and we hired consultants to do a lot of the work. But the existing staff, I wasn't here at the time, but the existing staff was looking at the reports that was being generated with chemical, water quality, um, even the biological stuff. And by the time the next plant was ready to expand, they, they presented to the county and they said, we can do this in house. We can do a lot of the stuff that we were paying people to do. So we had a, a, a staff position added and we started doing that internally. Now, not all of it could be done internally at that point. We didn't have all the capabilities, but we um, hired a consultant for those little bits, but we wrote in the contract that we, we, we would be involved with the sampling um, and worked with that. So by the late 90s, as we were kind of really getting into that and getting our, our pretty well established and comfortable with our protocols, more and more regulations were being, being handed down about water quality. It was really becoming a focus. And we were right in a position to kind of just adapt what we had already been doing and meet those new regulations, meet those new requirements. Uh, so really by 2000, all those regulations were becoming permit requirements. So they weren't just a curiosity anymore, sampling upstream and downstream of what's called hotspots. Um, if it wasn't for plant expansions, this was part of our permit requirements now. And, and everybody was starting to get those, those requirements as well. Uh, so by the early 2000s, all of our plant permits required that we start to do this sampling. And the, the point here is that all of these things we were, we were doing once out of curiosity and maybe on a voluntary basis, as they became requirements, as they became regulations, we were able to adapt and evolve with that. And um, that's a good, it's a, it's a good program. You don't have to start at the end where everything is in place. You can just start a program and kind of evolve as the regulations evolve, but keep that flexibility in mind. Keep, the, keep in mind, you're gonna have to tweak. You're gonna have to evolve with, with regulations. All right, so I go a little bit more into our program and water quality, but I wanted to have this poll sample pop up here. And this will give me a little more information, depending on how you answer, give me a little more uh, information of what I need to include in the next slide. The poll question should be showing. It's asking, what describes your water quality sampling program? Have you never considered a water quality sampling program? You are considering one. Consultants fulfill most water quality sampling requirements or in-house resources fulfill water quality sampling requirements. We'll just give it a moment, collect responses. All right, let's see. Looks like we had 50% with consultants fulfilling their sampling requirements. 33% have in-house resources, and 17% have never considered a water quality sampling program. All right, back to you. All right, uh, that'll help me give a little more information here. So one of the other components on the water first checklist was having a long-term monitoring plan and keeping it updated. And that really kind of blends in with the evolution of, of the program as well as regulations. So the point that I want to make with this slide is that while there are requirements for any program and permitting, you also want to keep in mind that this is a lot of work or you're paying a consultant a lot of money to do this. So you might want to focus on internal goals and internal uh, information that's, that you can use to help management make decisions. Uh, so kind of with that in mind, I'm going to start really in the middle of that slide, that 19 core monitoring sites. Um, in 2016, EPD handed down new regulations. And although we had adapted and kind of tweaked our program from the, you know, basically of the inception, up until 2016, we didn't have to make any 
major changes. We were able to adapt pretty easily. In 2016, it got to the point where we had built up quite an extensive list of sites and EPD's new requirements were pretty comprehensive. We couldn't do all EPD wanted done on all the sites we had established. But we didn't want to give that up because we had so much historical data and we had at that point um, incorporated that work into, into different permits, different management plans, different decisions were being made on the data that we were generating internally that weren't necessarily requirements from EPD. So we didn't want to give up all of those historic sites. So we had to kind of negotiate. EPD wanted us uh, to do a, a a bunch of sites with very comprehensive uh, sampling. And I'll go through that here. So as you can see from that slide, the three dry water chemistry per year. So that's dry weather sampling. We collect uh, basically water quality chemical analysis. Uh, so you're looking at VOD, fecal coliform or E. coli. Uh, you're looking at metals, nutrients, COD, a whole list of parameters. In addition to the three dry, they also wanted one wet weather sampling. That is, doesn't sound like much, but for our purposes, using in-house resources with our laboratory, we, we kind of need rain to fall, maybe best of it fell overnight, and we could pick up the samples in the morning and the lab could run them that same day. So a lot of time sensitivity there. It's actually, and then also with wet weather sampling, you need a 72 hour dry period before you collect the wet weather sample. So when it rains and then it's dry for a day, but rains again, you really can't collect that. So it becomes kind of difficult to actually get all those samples. Um, in addition to that, they wanted chemical sampling, flow monitoring. We hadn't added, we hadn't done flow monitoring except for very rudimentary. So that was another addition to our program, which increased data that was valuable for us as well, but it's longer in the field. Um, and more comprehensive, more time spent out, uh, which brings us back to the lab later, which then crunches the lab for time as well. So long story short, we can go into more details. If you have questions, feel free to get in touch with me. But we kind of set aside 19 core sites where we did all of the EPD monitoring exactly the way they wanted it done. And, and it was fewer sites than they wanted, but we, we agreed to keep our most of our historical monitoring sites where we do the water chemistry dry weather only four times a year. Uh, we dropped it to two times a year in the negotiations, but um, two times a year and no biological sampling. So that historical data is very useful for our internal decisions. And to give you one glaring example before we move on, all the EPD sites were all, they, they told us where they wanted us to sample and they were all concentrated at the end of a watershed. They were, it seemed, most interested in the water quality leaving the watershed going into the next. Whereas internally in Cobb County, we wanted to know, is the water quality at the top of the watershed better or worse than at the end of the watershed? Does it get better as it goes down? Is there one point in the watershed where it goes from being good to being bad? Is there something we can look at in that area um, that's causing a problem that needs to be addressed and fixed? So if we go to the next slide, um, the contents of this slide aren't necessarily important, but the, the point of the matter is that we're, we're using the data that we're required to collect for internal purposes. And we can create graphs and do some analysis and all of our reports and permit requirements, all of our permits that are submitted include all of this data, plus in-house internally, we're, we're looking at different functions and stuff based on that data. So that's the water quality component, the sampling, the assessment. Uh, moving on to let's protecting the water quality. This is really done in our community development and specifically our erosion sediment control section. Um, and I've reached out to some other departments to get some of this information. And um, in short, the, the state buffer, as everybody has, is 25 foot undisturbed buffer. The county adds to that 25 additional feet. So we have a 50 foot buffer on streams. And then depending on the watershed size or the drainage to that point, we increase the buffer as the drainage area to that point increases up to 200 feet. Uh, and again, all of those are undisturbed buffers. After the undisturbed buffer, Cobb adds a 25 foot impervious buffer. 
So you can still develop that land, but it's more like backyards as opposed to streets or sidewalks or roofs. Um, and on this slide, you'll see that seven mile water intake. This is gonna come up later, but this seemed like a good point to include the graphic. Uh, that red dot towards the bottom of that graphic there is the intake, one of our intakes in Cobb County for drinking water. And there's a seven mile radius around that where there's additional protections. Now, if it goes into another watershed, obviously that water's not gonna drain to that point, so it's not protected. All right, so when I reached out to the community development, erosion sediment, they came back with this long list of uh, ordinances and acts and permits and agencies and, and organizations that they kind of adhere to and follow. All these different uh, lists there have an erosion sediment factor that we enforce and follow. So I don't, there's a lot to get into on that. So I wanted to kind of bring it around to what we do with that information. Um, as the intro said, I work with stormwater and we work pretty closely with community development and erosion and sediment control. One of the aspects that I'm involved with, of course, if you think about erosion and sediment leaving a construction site, where is it gonna go? Either directly into a creek or in, down the street and into a storm drain. So there's a lot of times during my inspections that I might get in touch with community development and say, hey, I've got an issue. Can you go out there and take a look at it? And vice versa. They might be on a construction site and they say, hey, there's some stormwater issues out here. So they get in touch with me. Um, this interagency relationship, as you're thinking about watershed assessments, you think about it involves like a lot of agencies throughout the county. So there's going to be a lot of those communications there. Um, this I'm staying on this slide. The um, specific water quality work that I do now is based on a lot of inspections, and we have a dry weather outfall screening and a highly visible pollutant source HVPS uh, program that really takes up probably about 50% of our time. Um, the outfall inspection, and we are looking for the last point of stormwater discharge out of the storm sewer system, out of the stormwater system, before it goes into a creek. So you think about, that's, there's gonna be a poll question on that coming up here. But the last point of discharge before it enters into the creek, we go out and we look at all of those head walls and, and outfalls, and if there's flow, really what we're trying to find is an illicit connection. So if there's flow, we wanna find out, is there a washing machine connected to the line? Is it groundwater? Maybe it's just a pipe stream. We're gonna collect a sample there, take it back to the lab, analyze it, make sure it's groundwater. Uh, and if it's not, then we're going to go back out and we're going to try to figure out where it's coming from and determine what it is. The HVPS program, highly visible pollutant source, um, that's kind of a good housekeeping for smaller businesses like car washes and auto shops, restaurants that have above ground grease storage, grease recycling. We kind of go in ins a mini inspection of those businesses and look for uh, dumpster areas that are overflowing with trash or fluids that are being uh, running out of the dumpster and down the street, which could go into the storm drain. Uh, auto shops, we're looking for mechanical parts, engines and stuff that are leaking oil that are outside, just laying on the ground. We see that a lot. <clears throat> um, car washes, where they kind of do a pre-wash outside of the bays and that soapy water and, um, and chemicals are spraying after the car wash that could be washed down the storm drain. So it, it's kind of, like I said, kind of a good housekeeping. Um, the outfall inspection to go back to that, that's gonna go into our next uh, poll question. So we can bring up the next slide. So that picture there, kind of center the square picture with the yellow triangle at the bottom, uh, that is a head wall. So the water is gonna discharge from that pipe. And if it's the last point of discharge from that pipe before it goes into the stream, it's considered an outfall and we have to inspect it. We have a five-year permit cycle and each, in the, each of those five, each of the year of that five-year cycle, we do try to do 20% of our inspections. So at the end of five years, we've done 100%. Um, we're also kind of taking that information and updating our GIS as we go along with it. If I have more time, I can get into that. But for these purposes, the outfall, um, a lot of our stuff in our GIS system, it's not 
it's labeled correctly as a head wall, but it's not always labeled as an outfall correctly. So we have to look at these maps. You've got a picture here on the left and kind of determine which one is an outfall and which one we want to inspect. So take a look at that map, keeping in mind the last point of discharge before it enters a creek. And if it helps with the symbology, those red squares are catch basins. So water flowing off the street, if that were to go into a pipe and discharge, of course, that would be storm water and that'd be an outfall that we want to sample if it's discharging directly into the creek. So take a look at that slide and then I guess there's going to be a poll question to answer and you can determine how many outfalls you see on that map. All right, I'll give everyone just a moment to study the map before I pull up the question. All right. How many outfalls would you sample for your dry weather screening program? Just a couple more seconds. And we had 44% said four, 33% said two, 11% said three, and 11% said six. Okay. So the best answers are two and three. <laughs> the point I wanted to make with this is there's not a really clear definition of outfall. So as you're, if you set up a program or if you're doing this kind of water quality sampling. Outfall is a really tricky thing to, to determine. Uh, on this map, if you look, the lowest one, the lowest triangle there at 4719, water comes through the catch basin, through the pipe, discharges pretty much right to the stream. That's definitely an outfall. Uh, if you go to the very top of the screen and follow all those lines, that last one discharges right before the stream, definitely an outfall. If you want to go downstream, those two yellow triangles in the middle there at 2278, that's just a pipe. There might be a driveway or a low-lying area. Somebody put a pipe in there so that the, uh, the area probably, they needed to cross over it for some reason. It's not an outfall. It's just going under a driveway or road or something. Uh, the really debatable one is that one on the left of the screen between 2274 and 2276. There's two catch basins there. They're taking stormwater runoff from the street and they're discharging and through a, through a head wall. And it is the last point that they discharge before there's a stream. The debate is whether or not that water makes it to the stream or is just absorbed naturally. So different programs will interpret that differently. We would sample it here. We would consider it an outfall, but I've talked to other programs and because it doesn't discharge right to a stream, they wouldn't sample it. So there's, even as well defined as you know regulations are, there are some some tricky components to it. Okay, so moving on, um, one of the other topics was kind of coordinating land use and planning, and I just wanted to throw this up there as part of the it being in metro area, Cobb County that is, we have the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District. So there's a lot of regulations that are required for that in larger counties such as Cobb, where we already have water set assessment plans, most of those regulations are already being met. But if you're in a smaller community in the metro area and you're subject to this plan, then it kind of catches some of the stuff that isn't already required by EPD. But EPD, but the Metropolitan Plan really worked pretty closely with the EPD stuff, so they weren't duplicating efforts. Uh, kind of speeding through this as we run out of time, the uh, Plan review is a big component of watershed assessment. We want to make sure that kind of community development and stormwater, as they look at plans, that they're all working together. Um, a lot of the stormwater's planning is related to detention pond and volume of waters being stored. So when it rains or storm, the water collects in the detention pond. It's really flood control, but also water quality um, it gives pollutants a little time to settle out, uh, but it, it doesn't blow out the stream with, with high flood waters. 
which is also a benefit to the community, of course. Uh, that seven mile water intake that we talked about before, that's where this comes into play. All right, so I think next slide. Uh, the last component was open space and green infrastructure. Cobb County has been embracing green infrastructure, but some of our ordinances actually kind of were uh, in competition. <laughs> some of our existing county ordinances were in competition with our green space, with the green space ordinances that we were to follow. So recently the county has looked, they hired a consultant and we looked at all of our county ordinances and all of the green infrastructure, low impact development ordinances and, and identified conflicts and they've proposed improvements to, to our county ordinances so that we don't have that conflict and we can uh, do a little more with that low impact and green infrastructure. Uh, we do have rain gardens, we do have open space conservation uh, zoning. Um, so we, we've done what we can, but the biggest and bulk of the, our contribution to this program has really been floodplain buyouts. Uh, after the Katrina floods in 05 and uh, maybe Dennis or Reed, I forget which storm came right after that, there were a lot of flooded properties in Cobb County and we worked with FEMA to kind of buy up these repetitive loss programs. Uh, tear the homes down and remove all the rubble, of course, and then let that area just go back to natural setting. It's floodplain, it works, uh, it, it filters. We have a passive environmental area, open space that's, that's now dedicated that way. It won't ever be developed again. So it's really kind of a win-win. Um, we also had more flooding in 2009. And you'll see that picture at the bottom where the house still exists. It's been posted. That's a property that we're looking to buy out uh, as part of the 2012, I think we started. It was after the 2009 floods. Uh, we really started getting heavily into that. There's a lot of posting and re legal requirements. But from, the, from 2012, not including the early flooding, but from 2012 on, Cobbs bought out 71 properties, like you see at that bottom picture torn the homes down, let the communities or the, the land go back to, to kind of a natural environment. And that top picture, that used to be a cul-de-sac, five or six homes lined that thing. And that was one of the early flood buyouts. And now you can see it's going back to, to nature, you'd never know. And that's pretty much all I have. I know there was a lot. So if you need to get in touch with us um, privately through email, feel free. I'll be happy to answer any additional questions you got. Great. Well, thank you very much, um, Adam. And we will uh, kind of move along here. So again, we are going to do sort of a joint question and answer period at the end. So when we've heard from the folks at Brasselton, so please go ahead and put your questions into the question box and we'll line those up and have them ready. Um, but we appreciate all those details that Adam shared. Our next speakers will be from Brasselton. Um, but just a reminder, you may have a private chat message to you individually in, in the control panel. So check for those. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll continue along here. So Jennifer Scott has been the manager for the town of Brasselton since 1997. Um, because we have two Jennifers today, we'll probably refer to Jennifer Scott as Jen. Um, in her tenure with the town of Brasselton, um, the, the town has grown from approximately 600 residents to over 12,000 residents as a full service town with a millage rate of zero. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree, a Master of Science, and a Juris Doctorate. Um, and he's going to be um, helping Jennifer present this morning, or Jen. Uh, Mr. Hood has been the client and project manager for the town of Brasselton for over four decades. He is a graduate of Southern Polytechnic, now called Kennesaw State. Um, Mr. Hood resides in Winder with his wife, Karen, and their grandson, William. Thank you very much, um, Jen and Jerry. I'll let you take it away now. Okay, so we are able to see your slides. Uh, we don't see your camera yet, so you might have to make an adjustment there. Excellent. 
We can see you, we can see your slides. But we can't hear yet, Jen. There we go. All right, hopefully now all my, fantastic. So um, a riverbank restoration program, but it's, it's really more of a project that came out of our watershed assessment program. So we are in the final planning, restoring and stabilizing over a mile of riverbank on the Mulberry River. Um, not only is this project important for the environment, um, but we actually have over 6 million in um, infrastructure that we're gonna be protecting by doing this project. Just to give you some background on Brazelton, um, we're actually named after the Brazelton family. Um, we were settled in the, the late 1700s and our downtown was first settled in 1884 when the Brazelton Brothers store was built. And it's still, it's still here in our downtown today. Um, we became a town in 1916. We've only had five different mayors in 104 years and I've worked for three of them. Um, we were originally 1.2 square miles um, located in Jackson County, and we are one of only two cities in Georgia that is located in four counties, and we are in Jackson, Barrow, Gwinnett, and Hall, and we're a little over 12 and a half square miles. We're one of the fastest growing cities in the nation. Um, in 1980, our population was 418. And today the census estimates us at um, right at 13,000. So if you look at our zoning map right in the center, you'll see the blue line, that's the Mulberry River. And that will give you some idea of why it's so important to us. Um, it goes right through the, the middle of town. We have quite a few developments that are um, right on the Mulberry River, but also that's where our infrastructure is because of its location in town. Um, the river flows north to south. It's our geographic center. Um, the river originates in Hall County, right by Lake Lanier. Um, it's in the Oconee Basin and it flows to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it's always been part of our community um, and the health and welfare of that basin was actually put in our watershed management plan in 2001. Um, we were one of the, the first communities in Georgia to have a watershed plan with EPD. And since 2001, we've been monitoring the well being of that, that river and all its tributaries that come through town. And we've got um, lots of local development and environmental standards that protect the river. You'll see there some of our, our testing going on. It's the most beautiful river. Um, it is a great resource for town. This will give you some idea of the watershed boundary and our watershed management area. Um, it goes way outside our town limits. Um, it's not just, just in town that, that we monitor. And beginning in 2001, uh, prior to that, it was mostly farmland, but that's when our major development started coming in. Um, we've got the Mulberry Park subdivision, which just out of interest is the only subdivision in Georgia located in four counties within one neighborhood. Um, we have the Riverbend Falls of Brazelton, and those developments are in Hall, Gwinnett, and Barrow County. On the other side of the river from those is actually the State Arboretum, um, which is owned by um, the Board of Regents and managed by UGA. During those developments, we actually worked with developers. We have 107 acres of green space that's owned by the town that runs along the river and uh, a river walk that we built. We also have a major 16-inch outfall that's major for us. Um, that's on the west bank of the river that we constructed back when those developments were started. This will show you some of our development as we were putting in infrastructure along the river. So in 2004, we took that land that had all been donated by developers and we um, constructed a, the Mulberry River Walk along the west bank. It's two miles um, of trail, all naturalized trail. 
It's got all kinds of amenities, um, such as benches, there's a waterfall, there's picnic tables, we have a parking area and 100 acres of green space that's open to the public. And this gives you, um, that shows you what, what we've constructed today. That was actually just phase one. We're working now on phases two and three. So here's our first question. All right, so the first question is, when was the town of Brazelton incorporated? Um, so we give you opportunity to look at, get your answers in. Should be 100% since it was stated. <laughs> a more, couple of more seconds to let everyone get in. All right. A couple more seconds. All right. And uh, all right. Still getting it in it. Okay. We're going to close now and we'll show the results. So looks like 56% uh, everyone um, got it correct. All right. So the, the correct answer was, was 1916. That's when we were incorporated. Oops. Hold on one second. So in 2007, um, Brazelton has the ability to purchase water from three of our, our four counties, um, but we also produce our own water from a series of wells. And in 2007, um, we had a hydrogeological study um, authorized to look for some more pot additional potential well sites. Um, and four of the most productive sites that they located um, were within the green space along the, the mulberry on property that the town already owns. Well, this will show you some of the, the drilling that was going on and the locations there on the left. You'll see the, the red is all the different locations where they found well sites, but the four along the, the Blue Mulberry River are the ones that we drilled. So two of the sites were artesian wells. Um, they supply about 40% of our average daily water at 20 million gallons of water per month and they're right along the river walk. This shows you when this well was drilled and we were going through testing, people would walk along the, the river and I probably got half a dozen calls a week from people who thought that we had a water line that had broken because it just flowed continuously um, and out, out of this well site. So here's our next question. All right, the next question says, which county is the town of Brazelton not in? <laughs> All right. Answers are coming in. Let's see if we can get 100% of the right answer. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> All right. Couple more seconds. All right, we're going to close. And 75% <laughs> got the answer correct. Well, that, 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 that's great. So Banks County is the, the county where we are not located. We're in the, in the other four. So normal flows in the, the Mulberry River are calm, um, relatively clear water. 
this gives you an idea of what it looks like on a, a normal day. It's really beautiful. In fact, we were um, getting our water first designation. We took our um, water first group along the Mulberry River so that they could see the river walk. However, over the, the last 10 years, we've had heavy rainfall, there have been storms, and the river banks have started to erode. This gives you a, a good idea of what it started to look like. Um, you can see here where the bridge is located, how it's eroding next to it. Third question, Oshabar. All right, here we go. Where does the Mulberry River ultimately flow? Off of Mexico, Atlantic Ocean, Caribbean Sea, Pacific Ocean. All right. Answers are coming in. All right. A few more seconds to let everybody enter in their responses. And we are going to close. 90% says the Atlantic Ocean. Fantastic. So we're very, very close to Lake Lanier here, which flows to the Gulf. But we, yes, our river does flow to the Atlantic. Um, we have been doing constant testing in, in the Mulberry River. Um, the water, when it gets to us, is actually, um, it, it's, a, it's an impaired river and, and the water's not good. It's actually better when it leaves town. The dissolved oxygen levels are consistently good. But when we have a storm, we very quickly have high turbidity levels in that river. Um, if you look at some of our watershed monitoring, you'll see those levels during dry and wet and how they change. This is 2019, so just last year. And then look at the turbidity and the changes. This will show you some of the issues after storms. So in 2017, um, we started to notice that the, the erosion was accelerating and we were afraid that we were going to start losing all of the infrastructure that we had put in. Um, as I said earlier, it was over six million dollars, which to a town our size with no property taxes is an enormous amount. We have a 16 inch sewer line. We have the four wells providing 40 percent of our daily water. Um, all the raw water lines that run through there because the wells all are actually tied together and we treat the water in one location. We have the Riverwalk Trail, which is used um, continuously by both our citizens and the million visitors a year that we get to town. And then we have fiber optic control lines that, that run along the river and run our infrastructure. So we actually authorized to have some survey site assessments and create a bank stabilization plan for the upper mulberry. We were looking at um, going from Liberty Church Road, which is where our river walk um, parking lot is, up to Silk Tree Point, which is the road where that beautiful wooden bridge is located. That's where the major erosion areas were and where um, our infrastructure was the most threatened. So if you look at existing conditions, you'll see the river here and give you um, and I'll give you some some pictures of the different locations here along the river with the the bedrock and it's it's amazing to me how still the river is in some of these pictures but it's not a very easy area to stabilize because of the amount of rock that we have in the area We wanted, we worked with all of our neighbors along the river um, 
trying to make sure that we got as much stabilized as possible. We knew if we only did certain sections, the worst sections, that the other areas could either come back and erode what we've already fixed. Um, so we came up with a restoration plan. And one of the things that most important is the reestablishment of a bankful bench. Um, this will show you how we plan to do that. Um, a bankful bench is where there's a flat area adjacent to the stream. Um, we're going to go back in and, and build that and take out some of the flat areas. And this is where my friend Jerry um, knows a whole lot more about what we're going to be doing than I do. Um, so when you get to questions, he'll be answering a lot of the technical things. I find it fascinating, but I'm, I'm not educated in this. So we're also looking at doing some J-hook and tow hook stabilization, um, rock cross vein structures and some rock, rock and log deflectors. Um, this is the area and it will show you if, um, once you download, if you're interested, you can actually zoom in on this and see the different areas and what the plan is for that area and exactly how we plan to, to stabilize it. Um, all the way down to New Liberty, road there at the bottom is where the parking lot is for our river walk and that's where the um we've got a lift station there as well as our wells are close to that so this will give you some of the plans we have for doing the the stabilization explanations for tow wood and j-hook we actually have had some trees fall um recently during sally Normally we would be pulling um, those off, but we're leaving them in hopes that we can use them during the stabilization project. As we'd like to use as many of the ones that we have as possible. Um, we have a lot of rock in this area. So we're going to utilize natural rock as well. And create some of these programs. So, we're, it's estimated to cost um, 1.9 million for us to actually do this um, restoration project. We are looking at funding it through GFA's Additional Supplemental Appropriations for Disaster Relief Act. Um, ASABDRA, I think is the acronym um, that they use. We're eligible because um, a lot of the accelerated erosion actually was experienced during Hurricane Michael in October of 2018. Um, and so we have done, I believe it's the pre-application yeah. for that. So a lot of permits required um, because we are um, working along the river. It's a, a drinking water supply um, and it's also an impaired river. So we've gone through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, who required a construction plan review. And then um, they're going to require us to do seven years of post-construction monitoring and additional restoration if it's necessary. Um, we needed a stream buffer variance from Georgia EPD, of course, an erosion control permit. And then um, Georgia EPD Drinking Water Program is who's doing our construction plan approval. Um, we've done an environmental review document, which had all the communication with all those different agencies. Um, recently, I mean, just this month, we got our non from EPD. That was a very exciting day. And we're hoping to go to um, construction, big, big construction in the spring. So here's how our funding breaks down. We're looking at doing the $1.5 million GFA ASRA loan, that's a 0% interest for 20 years with uh, 200,000 in principal forgiveness. Um, we're applying for 400,000 in EPA section 319 grant, and that'll get us to our 1.9 million estimate. So here is our final question um, for you to, to give a try. The final question, we're going to go ahead and put it up. 
which one of these methods will not be used in the Bradleton project. Uh, it, you should have gotten it, hopefully. Um, let's see. The towwood structures, biofilters, J-hooks, or rock cross veins. Which one will not be used in the Bradleton project? Just cutting the last one off. Sometime. All right. Answers are coming in. It looks like some people were paying attention. Uh, yeah. All right. The answer. A couple of more seconds to keep the poll open before we close. All right, and we are going to close. And seventy-one percent said bio filters 14 said j hooks 14 said rock cross veins so 71 percent of you are correct fantastic so um you see our contact information here and of course under the handouts you can download our entire presentation but if you have um any questions after this you're welcome to reach out to either jerry or myself Thank you for letting us um, provide you with information on our, our project. It's a really big one for us. Great. Well, thank you, Jen. Um, and we look forward to your questions and hopefully um, we'll get some and maybe Jerry will have to chime in too. But at this point, we will um, start getting into the questions that we've been receiving. So I'm going to start with some of the folks, Ansley and Oshaba, that I sent to you. Do you want me to read it again or can you reiterate it to yourself? Um, sure. It was based on um, GIFA funding for different types of water first projects. Um, Oshbar and I can definitely speak on that. Um, at GIFA, our main loan programs are the Drinking Water and Clean Water State Revolving Funds. And these programs through EPA have a wide range of eligibilities. Um, you know, you might traditionally know of drinking water and clean water SRF as being for drinking water and sewer projects, but they actually can do a whole lot more. Um, both with the drinking water and the clean water, you can actually fund a lot of um, water conservation, water loss type activities, um, even for end use like plumbing fixtures and homes, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, with the clean water, we can do all kinds of um, green infrastructure, watershed, um, you know, repair projects like this one. Um, we can do buffers. We can even do plans like watershed management plans. Um, you want to add to that, Oshavar? Anything? Yeah. Um, so even in the drinking water, you could also do uh, with what she was stating with water loss, uh, AMR and AMI water meters. Um, you can install water line for your distribution system, uh, elevated storage tanks. Uh, these are different projects that you can uh, get funding for with GIFA. And we definitely want to be able to help as many communities uh, in, that, in that regard. Uh, from a drinking water stand flow standpoint, um, you're looking at inflow and infiltration with water uh, uh, from um, water line, um, you know, discarding old uh, pipe that may have been in, whether it's, uh, it's trying to think of Calcutta pipe, pipe that's been in there for a long time. I've seen projects all over the state of Georgia where you've had some old infrastructure that definitely needed to be replaced, concrete pipes. Um, and so you definitely want to utilize the funding that um, GIFA has available to be able to uh, help in that uh, process. Also with wastewater treatment plants from the clean water side. Uh, we've seen a number of um, wastewater treatment plants, um, rehab, and new wastewater treatment plants. And then uh, there's a couple of projects that I've been working on from a water side, a drinking water side, uh, which what uh, installation of um, new wells, um, discontinuing old wells that may have been I have a project currently right now that uh, they found contaminants in an existing well and they had to decommission that well. 
and they wanted to do some sites for new wells. So uh, this, these are a wide range, variety of projects that can be funded by GFRA, and we look forward to as many communities as possible to uh, really solicit us for the opportunity for us to help fund these projects. Great. Okay. Thank you, Ashura. And so we'll send also a, um, a link to a registration page for a workshop that's coming up to on October 8th that will yes. give you a good overview of all of GFIS programs as well as a few other state programs. For example, that Jen Scott mentioned, um, like 319, um, et cetera. So great. Well, I'll invite our other presenters too to, to turn their webcams back on. Um, so the next question is really for the Cobb County team. Um, and then we have a question for, for the folks from Brassel Sun. So just a heads up. So Cobb County, Adam and Jennifer McCoy, someone was asking about public involvement. So how supportive or not has have the citizens of Cobb County been um, on some of the projects that you guys have, have outlined today? Um, I think pretty supportive. We have a pretty good public outreach program. So there's a lot of education that goes on. Jennifer can talk more about that. As far as the like buyouts, I mean, obviously 71 properties, they have to agree to sell it for the, for the uh, green space or open space buyouts. Uh, they have to agree to that. So that's been pretty successful. Um, the inspection stuff, they're generally, they, are compliant. Some some are defensive in the beginning, but once we explain that it's really beneficial to everybody to protect the water quality, they they usually come along, and we approach it more of an education as a, as opposed to an iron fist and try to get them to comply just out of the right thing to do. I don't know if they had more specific questions about project. No, it was a pretty general question about, you know, overall how supportive they are. But um, maybe, maybe it would help, Jennifer, if you give an example of how you guys solicit the input. Like, how do you even hear from the citizens if they like the project or not? We we work with uh, probably over twenty thousand residents a year, just in terms of community outreach programming. Uh, so we have a pretty robust engagement with the community on an ongoing basis. Um, we get a lot of um, volunteer work, doing storm drain marking projects, doing stream monitoring projects, cleanups, that kind of thing on an ongoing basis, as well as um, community programming. Uh, we do rainbow workshops, um, lunch and learns, all kinds of stuff going on on a routine um, communications. We have newsletters and, and social media engagement. So lots of things are going out all the time from the water system to our, our um, we have about 193,000 customer accounts that are residential in Cobb. Awesome. I don't know if that answered the question, but we have, we have pretty um, good communications going on here. Yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like you're very busy at least. So thank you for that response. Um, for our Brazelton folks, we have a couple questions. We'll start with the one about um, septic tanks. So I think this question is asking, does the mulberry area where you you know the project that you're working on does it have septic tanks nearby maybe a lot of septic tanks a few just talk about how you're addressing that so within the town there are no septic tanks along the mulberry river um north of us in the unincorporated county there's not only septic tanks along the river but there are quite a few active farms but cattle farms and quite a few chicken houses. Um, so that's where a lot of the impairment comes from. It's, it's fecal coliform from, from mostly farming activity, not necessarily residential. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question for the Brazelton folks. You showed um, a few different permits that you needed to get so close to the end of the presentation. And someone was asking, how do you finance or how did you finance all those permits? So, so for the Army Corps of Engineers, <laughs> for EPD, et cetera. Um, so we, we, um, we've pulled money out of reserve to, to pay for the, the permitting as well as the development of all the plans to this um, point. Um, our, our water sewer system is actually 
um, twice the size of our town limits. We, we provide um, water and sewer to um, unincorporated residents and businesses in all four counties. Um, we also have um, one additional water um, provider within our town limits. Gainesville provides water to a portion of town, but our water sewer system is, is significantly larger than town. We operate it as an enterprise fund, and so they have their own reserves, and we pulled money out of reserves for this project. Got it. Okay, thank you. Well, I think today's presentation was was really, um, well, our two presentations were really interesting. I gathered, you know, from Adam, um, one of the things that, that he implied was just to, to start somewhere, right? So in terms of monitoring or any of these other projects, it can be a little bit overwhelming, especially if you're a smaller system or just getting started. Um, but the point I think is to, to not be overwhelmed and just start doing something. And I thought that that came out really clearly today. And you have other folks who've gone before you who would be willing and very happy, it seems, to share their experience. So you have on the one end of the spectrum, Cobb County, which is a whole county and it's very developed and has a relatively large staff. Um, you know, Jennifer and Adam might disagree that they have enough staff to do these, this work, but it's, it's a different scale than, for example, Brazelton. Um, but hopefully the message you get out of today's webinar is that whether, whether you're on this end of the spectrum with a really large county or a smaller city or town, that, that there is stuff that you can do. And Water First, um, the Water First program designation is available and accessible to you, um, you know, regardless of the size and sort of sophistication of your, of your local government. So um, I, think, I think our speakers today did a really good job of, of highlighting that, if you will. So with that, I'll see if the folks at GIFA have any closing comments or sort of announcements. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining today. Andley, Oshaba. Thanks, Stacy. Well, we just want to thank everybody who's been able to join us for this or any of the previous webinars. And the whole process has been a learning experience for us as well. And we're happy to learn how to provide this type of programming more in the future. Um, like I said at the beginning, uh, it would really help us if you fill out the survey that will come up as soon as you exit the webinar today so that we can learn how we can improve. Um, but we're just really excited uh, to get to know some of the folks that have been joining us uh, week after week here. And you're showing that you're really, you know, dedicated to working on this process. And we're excited to help you see through the Water First designation. Yeah, and I would like to uh, just reiterate what uh, Ansley said. We we definitely appreciate you guys being a part of these webinars for the past four weeks. Um, and go back to the YouTube page, uh, view, get some more uh, information if you haven't uh, to uh, help you in this process. And we are here and available. So if you guys have any questions, um, you know we're still in the process of growing and learning. Uh, ourselves, so we want to be able, and let's let's just grow together. Uh, as we grow, uh, we can help each other uh, grow as communities, and then also we as the program coordinators. Uh, so we're looking forward to uh, being available for you guys for whatever questions you may have. So we're excited, and uh, we want to want you guys to take full advantage of the resources that is available. Great. Well, thank you. Um, thanks, Anzli and Ushaba, and thanks everyone for being engaged. Thanks for your good questions and for introducing yourself, etc. And like Oshaba said, this is going to be available as a recording if you want to share with other people on your staff or maybe review it yourself later on. Um, and do we do look forward to the feedback that you will provide through the through the survey? We want to encourage you to take a couple of minutes to to fill that out. But thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your your day.